take their data and their methods freely, fully, immediately and widely available so that tiresome nuisances like me can check to see whether they did the sums right, which in this case, alas, they didn't. A report by the National Academy of Sciences in the United States also confirmed that the graph was defective, saying that its conclusions were no better than plausible at best and that it had a validation skill not significantly different from zero. But none of this, however much we may attack this graph, none of this tells us whether there was a medieval warm period. So now we're going to look at a few slides that establish where it is in the literature. Now this is done by taking 6,000 borehole uh, temperature readings from all over the world. Of course, this is not what the actual temperature was, but it gives you a rough idea that yes, there was a medieval warm period and yes, there was uh, a little ice age. And then we move on to an isotope study of a stalagmite from Spannagel Cave in the Austrian Alps. Another stalagmite, Cold Air Cave, Makabanskat Valley in South Africa. Lots of these papers are showing the medieval warm period. But when I first wrote on this, I was accused by various sort of militant websites on this subject of cherry-picking. So, Let's just see a few more, shall we? Just so you can see I'm not cherry-picking. Let's go to the Li Chao Peninsula from South China. Let's go to the Northwestern Arabian Sea. Let's go to the Sargasso Sea, to New Zealand, to the North Island of New Zealand, to the Spanish Pyrenees, to Northern Fennoscandia, to the Swiss Alps, three of them there, to Canada, let's go to British Columbia. Let's go to the Azores. Let's go to coastal Peru. Let's go to coastal Peru again, just for fun. Let's go all the way to the summit of the Greenland ice sheet. And there it is again. Let's go to a timescale sensitive reconstruction of northern hemisphere temperatures. There's your hot spot for the medieval warm period. There's your cold spot for the little ice age. They're clearly shown on that graph too. Here is the uh, reconstruction of a particular tree line from a particular species of trees, Zelkova carpinifolia, which shows the medieval warm period here. This is the line roughly corresponding to today's tree line. There it is, medieval warm period. Here is the Roman warm period, and here is the Holocene climate optimum, where for a period of around a thousand years or more, the temperature was quite noticeably higher because the tree line was higher. And why is it called an optimum? Because actually, warmer is better. Why we're gloomy about this is it's quite extraordinary. It's better to have a warmer climate. Why do most species in the world live in the tropics? Because it's warmer there. Why do practically no species live in the Arctic and the Antarctic? Because it freezes your nuts off and it makes reproduction difficult. And then let's just look at something from the real world. These graphs are all very well. But here is a tree stump. See how isolated it is. It's dated 1340 AD by carbon dating, and that's at the height of the medieval warm period. It stands in splendid isolation, well above today's California tree line. And because it did exist, because there was a medieval warm period, and it was in some places three and three quarter degrees Celsius higher the temperature than it is today, we cannot safely say that today's temperatures are exceptional. We can say, because everybody agrees this, that it was nature that caused the medieval climate warming. There's virtually nobody who would try to maintain that we were having enough of an influence on climate then to cause that warming. There was no medieval climate cataclysm. That's why we call it the medieval climate optimum, because it was rather nice and big cathedrals were built all over Europe. Civilization sprung up in places it couldn't have sprung up in before. Nature, therefore, it is a possibility, we can't draw this conclusion for definite, but nature may be causing most warming today. And finally, climate catastrophe, therefore, may not be either looming or likely. These are the conclusions we can respectively, respectively draw. So, if we assume that there were not enough 4x4s and SUVs driving around in the medieval warm period, what natural causes might there have been for the climate fluctuations over the past thousand years which we now have really rather good grounds I hope you'll agree for suspecting may actually have occurred. Well now we'll go on and have a look at one possible guilty party and that's the sun which is where after all the heat comes from 
At the moment, the polar ice caps of Mars are melting. There has been warming noticed on the surface of Jupiter, on one of the moons of Neptune, even on far distant Pluto, all at the same time. And why is this? Because astronauts are taking their 4 by 4s up into space? No, it's because the Sun, as we'll see, has been remarkably active. Now, Herschel, the astronomer, in 1801, noticed that when there were more sunspots and therefore more solar activity, grain prices went down because everybody was growing more grain. And this was in an 11-year cycle these sunspots tended to go. And even in that 11-year cycle, you could detect the changes in the grain prices because even in the relatively small changes between the maximum and minimum of a solar cycle, that was enough to influence the way the grain grew and Herschel spotted it. Now, Let's go to this very interesting paper by Sami Solanke. He's, he's one of the most expert solar physicists. He's very balanced. He doesn't take either side in this debate. What he says is the level of solar activity during the past 70 years is exceptional and the previous period of equally high activity occurred more than 8,000 years ago. We find that during the past 11,400 years, the Sun has spent only of the order of 10% of the time at a similarly high level of magnetic activity and almost all of the earlier high activity periods were shorter than the present episode. So there is clear evidence that the Sun is a lot more active now than it has been at any time since really the end of the last ice age. It's a quite extraordinary result. We go on then to look at the mismatch between CO2 and temperature over the period from 1880 to 1990. Now here you've got the CO2 graph broadly similar to what I showed you before, going up in a sort of near exponential curve, and here you've got temperature jiggling up and down uh, all over the place, and there really isn't a very good match between the two. So temperature doesn't track CO2 well, we've seen that, but it does track solar activity rather well as several papers, which I'll now demonstrate, illustrate. Here's one from Solanke again and his colleague Flig in 1999. The, the proxy for solar activity here is the length of the solar cycle. Quite a good track with temperature, as you may think. We go to the uh, central England temperature tracking solar activity. That's from a paper by David Bellamy in 2007. Then we've got one showing that monsoon activity tracks uh, solar activities in the paleoclimate now, going a long way back. This is Nef et al. 2001. And then, of course, there's the Arctic, where again you see a rather nice correlation uh, between the two. So, the question then arises, we've seen all these different correlations from the scientific papers. I could have shown you dozens more, but time does not permit. How much influence can the Sun actually have? Is it really as small as the IPCC would have us believe? Weren't there frost fairs on the Thames in the 60-year Maunder minimum when no sunspots were seen for ages? Well, the longest instrumental temperature record in the world is the Central England Temperature Series. Now, this series is very interesting. It shows that temperature rose 2.2 Celsius in 35 years between 1700 and 1735. The sun, not human industry, was the cause. Here it is over the left-hand side here. A very steep increase. Now, we have to be careful when we cite evidence of this kind because this is the oldest instrumental record we have and therefore the instruments may not have been all that reliable. We're also dealing with temperatures in only one place, central England. This might not have been a global effect. But even so, it's suggestive of the possibility that the sun, coming out of the Maunder minimum here, could have had a very considerable influence on temperature, an influence which would be wholly absent if you use the IPCC's very small estimate of the solar forcing. So is Solanke right to say that in the past 70 years there's been a period of exceptional solar activity? It's certainly exceptional in recent history. Here is the trend. This is done by another formidable solar physicist who has very close relations with NASA. This is Hathaway, and he shows here was your Maunder minimum, practically no sunspots at all. This is the sunspot number on the scale here. It's been smoothed a little, but it does suggest a pretty clear trend of ever-increasing solar activity going back to the year 1700. So we're looking at nearly 300 years of it. So then we come to the conclusion 
and these, this is not my conclusion, this is the conclusion of the International Astronomical Union Symposium in 2004. This is what they said, this is not me talking here. Solar changes cause most climate change. Solar cycles are 1180 and 200 years long. We've seen the 11-year cycle very clearly in the charts we've